Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome back to our winter semester. Um, for those that are joining us for the first time, we are studying the book of Deuteronomy. We're studying Moshe's final speech to the Jewish people, which goes on for quite a few portions of the Torah, where Moshe is giving over the mission statement of the Jewish people, not just to that generation, but the mission statement for the Jewish people for all of eternity. What is expected of us? What is it that God wants from us as his chosen people? And we have been going through it verse by verse by verse. Some of you have started with me way back in the book of Genesis some, some 30 years ago. Uh, but we make our way slowly throughout the Torah because there's a lot to discuss on each and every single verse. So welcome back to our winter semester. I look forward to joining with you every Wednesday at 1230. We're going to start off the first few weeks by Zoom only, and then perhaps if things lighten up, hopefully, Mir Tashem soon, we'll open it up to in-person and Zoom, but we'll keep you updated on that. So our focus today is on the verse of the Shema. The Shema is one of the main focal points of our prayers. It comes from the book of Deuteronomy, and we're going to focus particularly on, on one verse today, and I'll put that verse up on the screen for you. The verse says, "Vishinantam levanecha, vidibarta bam, bishiftecha beveisecha, uvelechtecha vaderech, uveshach bacha of kumecha." Verse seven translates, "And you shall teach them to your children," referring to the commandments of God that God gives over to the Jewish people, and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the way, and when you lie down. Lie down and when you rise up. That's part of the Shema that we say every single day in our prayers. This is about the responsibility we have to educate our children because we, we are the link. We connect our future to our past. We form a, a chain. Our children connect us to their children and we connect them to our parents and our grandparents. You see, we're not just living out our own lives. We don't just live for ourselves. We live on the shoulders of all of past history. So we live as a continuation of yesterday, and we live as a preparation for tomorrow, and we live for the present. They started of, of late putting on the commercials now for the Olympics. Every four years, the world tumults about this sporting event, and nations of the world all send their best athletes to compete in all different types of sports. So we have a Winter Olympics, we have a Summer Olympics. And in the Olympics, again, as I mentioned, there's many different events. One of the events in the, in the Summer Games is the relay team. And in the relay team, there are four members of the team representing the country each particular country. The country will put forth their best and their fastest to represent them. And there's going to be this competition where those running in the first position, they'll hear the shot, the sound of the gun, they'll take off. They have to run their lap. And then they can't just, once past the line, the next guy takes over. He has to pass the baton. He has a baton in his hand and they have to make a clean pass, which means the, the baton goes from one hand to the next, and if that baton falls on the floor, it'll take that extra split second to pick it up. That extra split second is the difference between finishing in the medals or being out completely. So it has to be a clean pass of the baton. Now, who are these runners? Each individual runner has trained to enter the Olympics for even more than four years, even before the last Olympics. They have been already conditioning themselves, knowing the target date of when they plan on competing, when they plan on running. And the training and the preparation that they go through is not measured in months. It's measured in years. How many years of a regiment that they will go through with their personal trainer and then if, let's say, they're representing the United States and the United States Olympic team trainers. 
They'll tell them exactly how many calories they can digest every single day, how much exercise, how many hours of weightlifting they need to do, how many train hours of training of running they need to do, et cetera, et cetera. Because right now, each of them, they're not just representing themselves, but they're representing a country. They're representing everyone in that country. And when they compete in this relay race, when they finish their lap, they're not done yet because now they're cheering on the next runner of their team because it's their teammate. So they're not competing against each other. They form one team. So if the member of your team does well, you do well. And if you win, they win. If you get the gold, they get the gold. It's a team effort. So let us imagine that you have devoted your life to this. And you have been running and running and running for years and training and exercising and sticking to a particular diet, which means you haven't seen potato chips and Coca-Cola in years. It hasn't even been in the same room with you. And now you've made it. And you're there. And let's suppose pre-COVID where there's 90,000 fans in the stadium. Millions upon millions watching it live on TV. And your leadoff man of your team is at the starting line. You have been given the honor and the responsibility to be the last member of the team, where the pressure is really on because whoever of the last team member, that's the one that's going to go to the finish line. The sound of the gun. And your member of your team is off. And he's running with everything he has. And he takes a small lead over all the other nations of the world. And he makes a smooth handoff of the baton. And your next team member makes his round. And then the third team member. And it's really looking like victory is at hand. Imagine years of dreaming and of training and of hard work. The third team member is making their way around. He's got the baton in his hand. And the lead has now opened up. And now the baton is about to be passed to you, the last teammate. The last member of the team is called the anchor. Your lead looks almost insurmountable. All you have to do is run your lap like you have trained every single day at the speed that you know you can, that your body has been conditioned that it could handle. Run your 400 meters and the gold is yours, the gold is your teammates, the gold belongs to your country. All eyes are upon you, your teammates are looking at you. Your family that flew in, they're there, front row seats, they're cheering for you. Your coaches, all of your country members, the world, the pressure is getting to you. So what if at that very moment you say, I don't need this. I don't need this headache in my life. I don't need this extra stress in my life. Ah, I quit at that moment. Not three months earlier, not a year earlier, not a month earlier, not even a week earlier, not even an hour earlier. Then, after three members have done their lap, you're standing there saying, you know, I don't want it. It's too stressful. But if you look into the faces of those who ran before you, and you see it in their eyes, and you see all their efforts and all their years of investment, and they have already accomplished the hard stuff. They're giving you the lead. All you have to do is run like you are trained to do. Then you'll know you can't quit. Why? Because this is not about you anymore. This is about others. This is about teammates. This is about your country. Why am I boring you 
with the Olympic scenario. You see, we are part of an unfinished race. We, the Jewish people. It's a race we didn't start, but it's a race we cannot quit. It's a race we dare not quit because our lives are not ours alone. We're part of a team and our parents are on that team and our grandparents are on that team. Our bubbies and our zaydis are on that team. Our ancestors who lived through a Holocaust, they're members of our team. Our ancestors who lived through pogroms and the gulags, they are on our team. Our family tree who survived inquisitions and expulsions from just about every country on the face of this earth, save the United States of America, which thank God has never done such a thing. But all throughout Europe, they each had their moment where they told our ancestors, get out. They are on our team. Go back in time. Go back in our story. Go back to the days of the Holy Temple. Go back to the days of the Roman destruction of the Temple. Go back to the days of Masada. Go back to the days of the Maccabees. Go back to the days of Mordechai and Esther in the story of Purim. Go back to the days of David and Goliath and Joshua and Jericho. Go back and remember the days when our ancestors were slaves in Egypt. Remember all of them because they're on our team. Remember your teammates. Remember their heroics and remember their sacrifice and remember their way of life and remember their commitment to God. Now with that, take the baton and run. You see, this race began with Abraham. He was the first at the starting line. It began with God selecting a team that will be a light unto the nations. That's what this class is about. The chosen people. What does that mean? What does it mean to be a light unto the nations? A team that will shed goodness and righteousness to all of the world. A team that will demonstrate and perform acts of kindness each and every single day. A team that will know that each and every moment of life must be utilized to make the world a more godly world, a better world. As Moses says in his farewell speech to the Jewish people as part of the book of Deuteronomy, he says, and I quote and I translate into English for you, this day... God, your God, commands you to perform these decrees and these statutes, and you shall observe and perform them with all your heart and with all your soul. God has distinguished you today to be for him a treasured people and to observe his commandments and to make you supreme over all the nations that he made for praise and for renown and for splendor and so that you will be a holy people unto God. This was and is our mission. This was and is our challenge. That's our goalpost. That's our finish line. L'sakein olam b'malchushakai, to fix the world, to prepare the world for a new world order. For this were we and our ancestors chosen. For this were we and our ancestors placed on this team. And we were given this baton to pass from one member to the next, from one generation to the next. We were given the Torah. That's our baton. The mitzvot. These are the tools we use to fix a world, to be a light unto the nations. So no, we can't quit now. It can be stressful at that line. It can be difficult. But my goodness, look at our teammates. They did it with their hands tying behind their backs under much more difficult conditions, and they did it well. Teach this to your children. Teach this to your grandchildren. You remember perhaps the old advertisement, give diamonds because a diamond is forever. 
a great commercial, I believe it was put on by De Beers. And it's, of course, true. It's give diamonds. It's always, it's always a good gift. But it may not be quite true because a diamond may be beautiful. It may be expensive. It may be durable. But could you call it eternal? It can be lost. It could be stolen. And if that happens, it leaves the recipient with the grief over its loss. If you really want to give a gift that's truly forever, give the gift of memories. If we give our children and our grandchildren memories that are worthy of cherishing and hanging on to, memories that resonate with some depth, with some godliness, with some truth, if we give them Jewish memories to grow up with and take with them into this daunting world that they will have to one day face on their own, then we're truly giving them something that's eternal, that will get passed from one generation to the next. I remember reading many years ago when NASA was first toying with the idea of space travel. So you've got to go back quite a few decades. So the scientists involved decided to conduct an experiment. This was told to us years ago by a speaker that used to work for NASA, Professor Velvel Green of Blessed Memory, when he spoke here in Agure. He told this over that these early these scientists working on, on, on the space travel program, they wanted to see what effect outer space would have on, on plant life. So they took several seedlings and they sent them up into space in one of the first satellites. And the seedlings were out there in space for several months. Everything in the capsule environment in terms of vitamins and irrigation was set up to allow these seedlings to develop into fully grown plants. When the capsules returned, these biologists were amazed at the results because they'd never seen plants like this. They were monster plants. There were roots growing from every side. In several places, a stem started to grow and stopped leaving leaves sprouting from all over the place. Leaves were growing where they didn't belong, where it didn't make much sense. It was a bizarre organism. And so the researchers came to the following conclusion. In outer space, there is zero gravity. And when plants do not have an up or a down defined for them, then they can't grow normally. They grow wild. And he brought out the point in this talk that the same is true for a human being. You know, we just marked the day on our calendar of Tu Bishvat, the 15th day of the month of Shvat is considered the new year for trees because man is compared to a tree, and so we celebrate that Rosh Hashanah, that new year for trees. As the Torah says, Ki Adam eats hasada. Man is like a tree of the field. If we don't define very clearly which way is up and which way is down, if we don't define for the next generation something called right and wrong, what is sacred and what is profane, then people, do, they don't grow up properly. We've got a wild and crazy society on our hands. If we feel we just have to give it to them to figure it out because we cannot go ahead and define what is moral and what is immoral, that it's not for us to go ahead and be judgmental on what is good and what is evil, now, what chance do we have for the next generation? Which way is up and which way is down? It's a parent's responsibility to speak this way to their children. This response of whatever, whichever way the wind is blowing, that society will make up the rules as it goes along instead of the rules making up society. Who or what is defining for our children today what is right and what is wrong? Are there any absolute standards out there whatsoever anymore? We have to be so afraid today of saying anything. Literally to, to the point today that on a form to have a checkbox, male or female, you can get sued for putting that there. No, you need to have a whole list of possibilities. Because we're so afraid of saying there's an up and there's a down. It doesn't mean we discriminate against those that may be different. 
but at the same time to say that everything goes out of fear of possibly offending someone. And so let's leave society without there being any rules of up or down. Says the Torah, Vishinantam Levanecha, you have that responsibility to pass along to your children, to your grandchildren, to the children of tomorrow, that there is a right and there is a wrong. Nature abhors a vacuum. We cannot reasonably expect our children to withstand the influences and pressures of the society they are exposed to without arming them with a strong counter-philosophy that will empower them to go against the tide if need be. Today, so many children live in their own world. They may live in the same home, but they share very little together because every, everyone is busy. Everyone's running in different directions. And then you have screens, either the, the, the cell phone they have with them or the laptop or the iPad or the screens that are as big in your house as the Great Wall of China and a remote that with a simple click or moving their finger on the screen of a phone, they have access to 20,000 channels of television, of movies, of TikToks, of, of, of Instagrams, and of Facebooks. You can't compete with this. If we leave it just to what society is feeding them, if we're not feeding them some direction, as we say in the Yiddish expression, achenvei, I don't know who made up the word, but it sounds so good, achenvei. It means, oh my goodness, oh my gosh, oy vey, but squared, <laughs> oy vey, oy vey, achenvei. Because we're going to leave it all to fun and to fantasy and entertainment and then to excitement and to artificial joy because it's not real. There's nothing real about it. Let alone the, the depression that we are causing to our teenagers of today who feel they need to compete with what they're seeing on social media. And if they don't have 4,000 friends, there must be something wrong with them because how come this person has 4,000 friends and you only have 360 friends? And how many likes did you get? Oh my goodness, you only got three likes. Who do you think you are? You're never going to get a date out there. Or you can't, can't compete with the looks, with the pictures that people pose. It, it's a dangerous, dangerous mental and emotional world we're putting our children in. And if we put them into this world and we don't give them direction, they're going to struggle. They're going to struggle to make it. This is what Moshe was saying way back then. Maybe he didn't know about Facebook. Maybe he didn't know about Instagram or Snapchat or TikTok. Maybe he did. I don't know what he knew. But he clearly told us, we need to set the agenda. I remember years ago seeing this ad in the Jewish Journal. I haven't seen it in, 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 a, in a quite a few, maybe a decade it's been. But I remember seeing this ad in the Jewish Journal for Universal Studios. I thought, that's odd, that Universal Studios is now advertising in the Jewish Journal. So I looked at it again. This is what the ad said. It said, 13 reasons, the big number 13 in big to catch your eye, 13 reasons to have a bar mitzvah at Universal Studios Hollywood. So they were obviously trying to market to the Jewish community of why you having your bar mitzvah at this temple or this synagogue or why are you having it in this hotel or in this ballroom? You can have your kids bar mitzvah or bas mitzvah here at Universal Studios. So the first rule they teach you in marketing is you have to have a line that will catch people's attention. Well, that got my attention. 13 reasons why I should celebrate my kids bar mitzvah at Universal Studios. So now I'm going to look closely. What are the 13 reasons? Reminding me, like, remember the David Letterman show, the top 10? Well, they had 13. So let's see what the 13 reasons we should all decide to book our children's or grandchildren's bar or bat mitzvah at Universal Studios. Number one, because they're going to give your guests a private studio tour. That's right. You're going to get your own tram, and you'll be able to have your own tour through the back lot of Universal Studios. Number two, the fun. 
because your guests are going to have a lot of fun. It's Universal Studios afterwards. I love going to Universal Studios. Number three, up-close celebrities. That's right. They're going to send some of their dressed-up celebrities to join your guests at the bar mitzvah. And they have a picture there with some warriors with some swords. Great guests to have. Number four, because we at Universal Studios, we have T-Rex size rides. I think that's when they were opening the dinosaur ride. And so your guests will be treated to a ride on Jurassic Park. They have indoor seating for up to a thousand. Very few venues can compete with that, right? A thousand guests you can have if you do your bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah at Universal Studios. Get this, number six. They will give you and your guests a private showing of Terminator 2. Yep, a private showing. I'm not going to have to go to the movie theater. You're going to get a private showing. Number seven, because we provide excellent service. Number eight, excellent park access. You get valet parking. You can't, you can't compete with this. You can't compete with this. You can either get the valet or you can get to park in the section that's closer to the entry. Number 10, number nine, fabulous food. Number 10, live entertainment. Number 11, thrilling attractions. Number 12, customized theme parties. And number 13, because it's your child. And it closes a bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah at Universal Studios Hollywood is one that they'll remember forever with more big entertainment under one roof than anywhere else, plus a wide range of fantasy settings that you can customize to create a dream come true. And we have created our own special event department for bar mitzvahs that can handle every detail from music to catering to live entertainment to decorations featuring real movie sets and props. Give your child the star treatment. Kid you not. Full page ad. Jewish Journal. Now, I I have been doing bar mitzvahs now for some 38 years, and I got to admit to you, I can't compete with this stuff. I I, I can't do it. I can't give you the valet parking on Shabbos. That's a separate problem. But the T-Rex rides and Conan the Barbarian is going to come. I just, I can't do it. Now, some of you may be chuckling because it's, it's pretty funny. But isn't it quite sad? An ad featuring in a Jewish newspaper 13 reasons for a bar mitzvah and there was not one mention in the 13 of one Jewish practice. Not one word of anything Jewish on those 13 things. Is this a Judaism we can expect our children to take seriously? Is this a Judaism that we think our children will devote their lives to? Is this a a religion that we want to tell our children to give priority to? Is this a faith that we expect them to make sacrifices for in life? To feel a need to perpetuate onto their own children and grandchildren because they too can then have a party at Universal Studios. The truth is there is only one reason to have a bar mitzvah, period. And that is to undertake the responsibility and the privilege of being part of God's chosen people. That's what it's all about. That's what it is. I know a bar mitzvah universal could be exciting. But where where is the passion for Judaism? Not for the party. Where's the passion and the love for the mitzvot, for the traditions, for the rituals? Where's the focus on our heritage? Where's the mention of of tefillin? 
I've shared this, this story before. I've shared it quite a few times. I'm going to share it again. I feel that every time that I share it, in some type of way, I, I elevate the soul of this person, the focus of this story. It took place quite a long time ago, very early on, you know, if you want to call this a career, so about 36 years ago. I got a call from a woman who had heard about Chabad, and she requested an appointment to speak to me about a problem in her life. <laughs> Just going off on a tangent here, I, I still recall the early days. I, I started as a rabbi quite early. I was out here when I was 20 years old. I was ordained when I was 21 years old. And the first few years when people would make an appointment to see me, the, when they would walk in, they would all start off with the same line. And the line was, I have an appointment with your father. Is he in? <laughs> uh, very few uh, thought that kid was the rabbi that they made the appointment with. Anyway, this woman was no different. She walked in. She asked if my father was in. I said my father at that time was Baruch Hashem alive in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> but you have an appointment with me. You're the rabbi? You, the, you look so young. <laughs> anyway, what was her problem? She had a daughter. Her daughter's name was Hope. And Hope had converted to Christianity, and she joined a church. She married someone she met in church. She became very active in the church. She joined the choir of the church. And no one has been able to even have a conversation with her daughter to come back to Judaism. And so she heard there was this new rabbi in town, young rabbi, so maybe you want to give it a shot. So I took the phone number, and I called Hope. Hi, my name is Mo Shabrisky. I met your mom. She wanted me to reach out to you. Perhaps we can get together. Perhaps we can talk. And she said, no. <laughs> that was it. No, I have absolutely no interest. No interest in talking to you. No interest in getting together. No interest in looking into any Jewish practices, anything of the sort. Okay. Well, I didn't succeed there. A few years later, I get a phone call. She says, is this Rabbi Brisky? I say, yes, it is. She said, my name is Hope. Now, Hope is, is a unique name. It's a special name, right? You don't forget it. So I right away said, Hope, I, I remember you because I, I never forgot it. And she said, you offered me a few years ago the opportunity to get together and talk. Can we do that now? And I said, sure. And she said, is it okay if my husband comes along? And I said, of course. So we met at the then Chabad house in Westlake Village, 741 Lakefield Road, suite number E. That's where we started off this journey of Chabad in the Canal Valley. And she told me why she was there and why she wanted to talk. Unfortunately, Hope was diagnosed with cancer. And she spent many weeks in the hospital, thinking, praying, talking to God, thinking about her life, her choices, her journey. And suddenly, she felt very uneasy. Something felt wrong. Maybe I never gave Judaism a chance. Something about it just made her uneasy at that particular time in her life. Maybe she never studied Judaism. So she started reading a lot. And then she met with her minister, and she asked him some, some difficult questions. And then she remembered that years earlier, someone from Chabad had called her and wanted to talk. So she looked up Chabad of Westlake, and here I am. I want to talk. And I want my husband, who's definitely not Jewish, to be part of this conversation. So I asked her, where did it all start? Where did this journey that took you into Christianity, how did it begin? Why did you join the church? Why did you run away from Judaism? And she told me that she actually went to a Hebrew school, that her parents enrolled her in a, in a Hebrew school. And she was very spiritual by nature. And as a kid, she would ask questions. She always asked questions. She remembers asking her teacher about God, about heaven, about Messiah. 
And not only was she not answered, but she was ridiculed as being a fanatic. She was ridiculed not just by her fellow students, but by her teacher herself. And this disturbed her. This bothered her. She wanted a religion that actually believed in something, that believed that when you're praying, you're actually talking to a God, and that there is a God, and that God hears your prayers, and there is a heaven, and there are commandments, religion, something, a faith, that God communicated some way of life for us. That's what she wanted. And she was mocked for simply asking the question. When she was 15 years old, a friend from public school mentioned that she goes to religious classes at a local church. And they talk about all these things there. And when they pray, they really feel they're praying and they're talking to God. So she invited her to join for one week. Just come to class and see if you like it. And she went. And as Hope tells me, I loved it. It was fascinating. It was heavy. It was focused on God. They spoke about heaven. They spoke about a Messiah. They spoke about prayer. Subjects that in her life was simply shoved under the rug of don't be a fanatic. Subjects that were shunned or denied. And so the next week she went back and the next, never telling her parents that she was just hanging out with her friends, but she was really going to Christian religious study group on Sundays. And she continued this for months, and then for years. And then when she was old enough, she moved out of her home. She moved to Long Beach. She joined a church. She joined the choir. She met someone else in the choir. They dated. They fell in love. They got married. And here he is, my husband. And the rest is history. So we spend hours talking about Judaism. Yes, there is a God in Judaism. And God is involved. He cares. He cares about you and he cares about your actions. And he gave us clear instructions. And yes, there is a people, a Jewish people, that he gave responsibilities to specifically to bring blessings to all the families on the face of the earth. And it's a privilege to be one. And there is an afterlife. And our soul does live on for eternity. And no, the Messiah is not a Christian term. It's a Jewish term. It's a Jewish belief. They borrowed it from us, but soon, very soon, they'll have to give it back to us. It's up to us to bring the Messiah. Our actions help hasten the coming of the Messiah. And so on and so forth. You can imagine the amount of questions this girl had. It was an eye-opening experience for her. The idea that God cares about what I eat. I remember this part of the conversation. When, when we talk about kosher, Jew to Jew, the Jew generally feels like, what does God have to bother me so much and much of me? I can't eat this. I can only eat that. Let me eat what I want, right? That's, that's the initial reaction, especially someone that wasn't raised kosher. She took it this way. God cares about every meal I have. God cares about what's on my plate. God has such a relationship with me that everything that I consume, that I eat, he cares about. It wasn't an imposition for her. It was, wow, God is actively involved in my life. What I do matters. What I do is significant. At the end of this long session, she says this. Can I come back to my Jewish roots? And before I had a chance to answer Hope's question, her husband, who's been sitting there quietly the entire time, speaks up and says, and I would be interested in attending classes on Judaism together with my wife. We're going to do this together as a team. I connected them with Chabad in Orange County, and they began attending classes there. After two months, the cancer returned, and Hope passed away just a few weeks later. And I believe, 
I've always maintained this belief, that hope died a complete and holy Jew, a pure soul that was lost in the darkness, that was lost in the cold, and was able in her final moments of life to find her way back home, to feel the warmth, to experience the real passion. You see, when we remove the warmth and passion from Judaism, we don't make it more appealing. You may think it does, but it doesn't work. It definitely doesn't become more enduring. The notion that if we take away this mitzvah and that mitzvah and this ritual, it'll become more palatable, it'll sell better. It's a farce, it's fallacy, it doesn't work. There is a Torah. It's God's instruction booklet for how we're to lead our lives. And it works best, it functions best when it's left in its original position and we strive to reach it with passion and with vibrancy. A cold Judaism doesn't inspire. A diet Judaism doesn't sell because it's not the real thing. Remember the days of Gorbachev. Premier Gorbachev introduced Glasnost and Perestroika to the Soviet Union, which ultimately led way to the eventual collapse of the whole communist empire. And he writes in his memoirs that what led him down this path was a very simple question. If communism is such a great system, why are so many people trying to leave our country? Why is there no happiness here? Why is there so much hunger? Maybe, maybe Karl Marx and Lenin and Stalin and Brezhnev are wrong and it doesn't work. Judaism, without the passion and without the fervor and without the excitement and without the traditions, it doesn't work. Our children need to see a Judaism in their home that's alive, with some depth, with some honesty, with some deed. This is not about becoming observant. It's not about becoming orthodox. It's not about becoming religious. I know all these words may scare some of you. You see, religion is what God can do for you. Judaism is what you can do for God, and what you can do for your family, and what you can do for your neighbor, and what you can do for a total stranger. And to do so, you need that element of passion. You need it to mean something. So whatever it is that you do, whatever mitzvah you do, do it with an excitement so that your children and your grandchildren recognize it, see it, and it catches on. Vishinantam levanecha vidibarta bam. This is what Moshe is pleading with us in this final speech to the Jewish people. I do want to close on, on a, a note of a personal simcha, a celebration of Mazel Tov, in our family, our son Yassi announced his engagement a few days ago to Leia Weinberg of Cape Town, South Africa, which means that the wedding is going to be far away from here. But we did convince uh, Leia, his bride, to join us for this Shabbat and for Sunday. So she'll be joining, the bride and groom will be joining us. If you can, please join me Sunday evening at the outdoor campus here at Chabad. 30345 Canwood Street. We're going to set up a big engagement party outdoors. If you want to just pop in even just for a few minutes to wish them a mazel tov, give a toast to the bride and groom. We'd love to have you join in the simcha of our family. It's this Sunday night right here in the Gura Hills. It'll be outdoors, so we're trying to keep it as, as safe as possible for all of you. Uh, starting at 7.30. So anytime you can pop by from about 7.30 to 9.30, please stop on by. As long as you can stay, you're welcome to stay. We'll have some refreshments and desserts for you. But more importantly, to meet the bride and groom and wish them well on their journey into life together. I look forward to sharing this simcha with all of you from the community, from our classes. Uh, We should only all celebrate many, many simchas together. Tonight at 7.30, I'm going to be teaching another class. It's a double-header Wednesday. We're going to be studying the story of Joseph and his brothers. It's at 7.30. Check jewishacademy.com to get your Zoom links. All the best, everyone. Take care.